waiting all week for this day. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I can hardly wait for the next one, too. Uh, yes, it is a rest from a, a weary week for many of us, I know, and I'm one of them. So I just thank God for the chance to set the things of the world aside and, and come and praise and worship our Heavenly Father. So, welcome. And the title of my message this morning is, Who is Your Enemy? I have a question for us to consider this morning, and that is, who is your enemy? You know, in the world today, there are literally millions upon millions who do not realize that in the spiritual realm of life, we all are a vital part of something that is happening on a very grand scale. And I'd like to read from Revelation 12, verses 7 to 9 this morning from the Living Bible, where it says, Then there was war in heaven. Michael and the angels under his command fought the dragon and his hosts of fallen angels. And the dragon lost the battle and was forced from heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world was thrown down onto the earth with all his army. It's not over, though. The Bible tells us that there is a great ongoing controversy. No person is left out. We are all in the middle of it. The devil and demons in this world are bent on winning this battle against the omnipotent God of all creation. And you can be sure that Satan is determined to take as many casualties with him as possible. Don't be one of the victims. Who is your enemy? Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, our, our Master and our King, we praise you and thank you for supplying all we will need to be victorious in the conflict between good and evil. Teach us how to love one another and, and be united in our fellowship. Help us to always stay close to you in all we do and all we say. Protect us, Lord, from the spiritual attacks we face from the devil. May we grow strong in your word and, and know your power in our lives today. O oh, lead us and carry us in the path of love and fellowship. And we pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. See, Paul wrote about who we are fighting and, and gives us the knowledge that we must know to be victorious. And it's written in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 12. And I'd like to read this from the Message Bible. It says here, God is strong and he wants you strong. So take everything the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. There is no weekend war, or this is no weekend war that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. It is for keeps. A life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Don't miss it. The seriousness of Paul's message is made crystal clear in that last sentence. He says, this battle is to be a fight to the finish. It's not a time for us to stand idle. In God's holy Bible, we are told that we have protection 
that will save us. We must don that protective gear. This protection is called armor because it will keep us safe. And next, Paul tells us about the pieces of the Christian armor. He explains about the breastplate and the shield. He tells us about the sword and the helmet and so forth. He tells us these things because we are all in this battle. We must know our enemy, though. The attacks that we face are are from the devil and demonic forces. Never forget something very important here, though. Our enemies are not people. They're devils. It makes a great deal of difference if we know this, and in a practical way. You know, it's an amazing realization to look a person in the face And no, he or she is not our enemy. So then what? What if we do happen to have a a person who we think is an enemy? I want you to know that the Lord uh, tells us how to handle this person. It's in Matthew chapter 5. And what does Jesus say? He says, love them. Now, Jesus will never tell us to love the devil. He'll never, he never told us to do that, and he never will say that. And you know why? Because the devil is our real enemy. He's beyond redemption. He's hopelessly dedicated to, the, to end the government of God in heaven and on earth. He's not our friend. He never was and never will be. That's what this verse is, is saying as it talks about the principalities and powers of and the rulers of the darkness of this world. We are all in a struggle, a fight, a battle, a, a, a warfare against the forces of evil. It's not a fight against people. Out of love for all mankind, Jesus prayed for and died for his murderers. He forgave them. This proves that that Jesus did not consider anyone beyond the reach of his divine love. I mean, men that spat in his face, that beat him, that made a crown of thorns and, and pressed it down on his brow. Well, in a way that we find incomprehensible. He loved them. This is God's divine love. And Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood in Ephesians 6.12. It's very, very clearly stated here in this verse. Our enemies are not people. Our foe is out to get everyone. This attitude of me first, uh, of my wants and desires above all else, well, this is the disposition of Satan. And I want to read you something from the Desire of Ages on page 3, 436. It says, he, Lucifer, sought for himself the highest place and every being who is actuated by his spirit, will do the same thing. He's still looking for a higher place. You know, he once held the number one spot in heaven, but that just wasn't good enough for him. He wanted more. So by force and by greed, in his pride, He was out to take over God's rule. And God to him was just in the way. 
Again, Desire of Ages, page 3 or 436, it says, The kingdom of Satan is a kingdom of force. Every individual regards every other as an obstacle in the way of his own advancement or as a stepping stone on which he himself may climb to a higher place. In a great show of pride, every individual, every person in Satan's kingdom regards everyone else as a stepping stone to walk over and to crush. To the devil, we are all just obstacles. We are nothing, just a rock. A rock to be pushed away and, and stepped on. This ugliness is the kingdom of Satan. Well, there's something worse than that, my friends. There's something worse than being a stepping stone. Do you know what it is? It's using other people and stepping on them. That's the worst thing ever, but that's the spirit of Satan. We must know as followers of Jesus that we will suffer because of the devil's actions. But let's be strong. There's hope in Jesus. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.15 from the Living Bible. These sufferings of ours are for our benefit. And the more of you who are one to Christ, the more there are for, to thank him for his great kindness. And the more the Lord is glorified. If someone sees me as a stumbling stone in their, in their road to be pushed out of the way or as a stepping stone so that they can rise to power, the Bible tells me not to feel anger or revenge. And the amazing fact here is that anything they do is going to end up being for my good. We are assured of this in Romans 8, 28, where it says, all things work together for good for them that love the Lord. All things. Let's believe it. Also, God won't let the devil hurt us if we abide with Jesus. May we understand that nothing in the world can touch us except by his permission. Do you remember Jacob, or Job? Just remember Job. We can be at peace with all things. Now, here's one of the, what I think is one of the most wonderful paragraphs ever written from Ministry of Healing, page 489, where it says, The Father's presence encircled Christ, and nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. Here was his source of comfort, and it is for us. He who imbued he let me start over again with that he who is imbued with the spirit of christ abides with christ whatever comes to him comes from the savior who surrounds him with his presence nothing can touch him except by the lord's permission all our sufferings and sorrows all our temptations and trials, all our sadness and griefs, all our persecutions and, and privations, in short, all things work together for good. All experiences and, and circumstances are God's, are God's workmen whereby good is brought to us. You see, God 
Jesus, I mean, lived out this truth so fully when that mob came and, and, and started to take him. He submitted to them. Now, Peter, you know, Peter stepped up and, and tried to help Jesus out here. He wanted to fight. So Peter grabbed a sword and, and cut off a man's ear. Well, maybe not in these exact words, but Jesus said, Peter, don't think like that. For one thing, Peter, if you draw your sword, you're liable to get hurt or killed. It is so a fact that whoever takes the sword will perish by the sword. And secondly, Peter, my father could give me 12 legions of angels right now. A whole legion for every disciple. And, and one more thing, Peter. The cup which my father has given me to drink. Shall I not drink? Was the father really holding up that cup to Jesus? Yes, it's true. Jesus Christ had, had settled it there in the garden before the mob came. Christ had settled it in his mind that, that he was willing to move ahead on that bloodstained path and accept all the sufferings, the sorrow, and the pain. He knew his father was in charge. He also knew his father wouldn't let anything happen to him unless it was necessary for the salvation of others. Should we ever doubt his love? Now, Jesus didn't a look at those people that were treating him that way as enemies that he was to fight. He accepted it as what the Father allowed. Now, standing in front of Jesus, Pilate asked him if he was a king. You know, the Jews accused him of being someone who was making himself a king. And to that, Jesus said, in John 18, 36, let me read it. Our verse today, my kingdom does not belong to this world. If it did, my servants would fight so that I would not be handed over to the Jewish leaders. No, my kingdom is not an earthly one. If Christ's kingdom had actually been the kingdom of this world, if his enemies were the people of this world, then he would train his men as soldiers to fight against them. See, Jesus' kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. Our enemies are spiritual. We wrestle not against human beings, flesh and blood, as the Bible puts it. We are not in a fight with someone or some person we encounter in life. We'll never try to push some person out of the way so that we can be in first place. We'll not try to prove we are better than someone else. And we must not be afraid of what other people may do to us. You know, reminds me of a dream. I, and I think God taught me something in a dream once. With the troubling thoughts of anxiety in that dream, I, I prayed about it. And then miracle of miracles, I was never bothered by those thoughts again. God taught me to come to him in my hour of need and that he would save me. Jesus, my protector, answered my prayers that day. And I know God will show us wonderful things in dreams. He does that. I personally have had uh, things like this happen in, in my life more than once. 
And the only explanation to me is that he loves me and he gives me peace. And he will, to you too, just pray and believe. Anyway, just know the devil is out to get every one of us. If we belong to Christ's spiritual kingdom, we have a battle to fight. And again, I repeat, it's not with people. Our enemies are devils and unseen forces of evil that we must fight against. Isn't it a wonderful thing to know where to put our energies and know we must work together for God's glory? We're wasting our energy if we're pulling down other people that we meet. We're to be kind-hearted to others. We're to love them. Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. When will the world ever learn this? We're not engaged in a, a battle of will or wit, of muscle or mind. When will the light ever come on? The people of this world, those who do not know the love of God, they're trained in just the opposite mindset of what I'm saying here. The natural inclination is to uh, live to get ahead, to win over somebody. And the only way you win in the world is for somebody else to lose. You know, I'm happy and fortunate to have grown up in a Seventh-day Adventist community back there in Lincoln, Nebraska. And in College View Academy, we never did competitive sports. We played all kinds of sports, but we did not compete against other schools. Now, I'm not judging this morning if that's right or wrong, but for me now, I am very happy that we learned this back then. Uh, well, you know, times have changed, right? I think competitive sports has become more common even in our schools. But okay, I'm getting off the track here a little bit, okay? But let's get back on track. Let's, let's talk about Jacob. Jacob got the idea that the way for him to get the blessing was to scheme. Figure a way to maneuver it away from his brother Esau. God wanted him to have it all, all along. And if he had only gone at it God's way, he wouldn't have had to lie or scheme or steal or anything else. In God's own time and way, he would have had it without sorrow, with all, without all that repentance and, and sorrow that became necessary. I'm saying that the joy of knowing that you are not trying to get something or anything from somebody else, that your enemies are not men and women, is God's plan. I'm not trying to compete with somebody or in not trying to compete with somebody, you're not trying to get something from them. You are instead teaming up, trying to help everybody. Was Jesus trying to save his murderers? Think about it. He prayed for them, didn't he? Now, our enemies are invisible. Our greatest thought should be, how can I help this person? What can I do to help that person? How can we help people that we're around? Well, you may say, well, they, they will or may take advantage of me if I offer help. Well, if you're thinking that way, I, I think you've missed the point here this morning. Did they take advantage of Jesus? Well, of course they did. 
Will they take advantage of you? Well, yes, they may very well take advantage of you at times. But the Christian should not have to worry about that. It's all in God's hands. Philippians 2, verses 3 to 4, easy to read, says, In whatever you do, don't let selfishness or pride be your guide. Be humble and honor others more than yourselves. Don't be interested only in your own life but care about the lives of others too. Our work is not to take advantage of others or, or get ahead at the expense of others. You know, Philippians 2, 4 to 8 from the message says, if you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. Oh, yes, and there's a little bit more here. There's verses 5 through 8, which says, Think of yourselves this way, or the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of the status no matter what, not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, be became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life, and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Well, follow the downward steps of Jesus with me for a moment. There he was, way up there in heaven at the throne of God, equal with the Father, down he steps, down, down, down. He becomes a man. He's made in the likeness of humanity. Then, in that life here, he becomes a servant. He then becomes obedient to death, even the death on the cross. He couldn't have gone any lower than that. No way. No way, at every step, it was by his choice because he loves each one of us. And I pray we will see that pattern. Praise God for Philippians 2, 9 and 10, where it says, Wherefore God hath also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. In conclusion, as we choose to follow Jesus in this path of humiliation and service, our reward will one day be to share the throne with him through the eternal ages. Let's make sure our reason for following is not to, not to get the throne, okay? If that's our motive, We'll get tired and we'll quit long before we ever get there. May our motive be that God has put love in our hearts for others. May we not wrestle against flesh and blood. 
May we know that our enemies are not people. May we understand true reality, which is that all things work together for good for them that love God. So remember, no man is your enemy. Your enemy is the devil, and we will fight with all our weapons of faith in Jesus, with our love for Jesus, and with loyalty to Jesus. This is how we will share his spirit of service. In the end, our great reward will be a home where sin and sorrow will be no more. Faith will be the victory that overcomes the world. Amen.